so sir firstly i want to just begin with understanding your early years what was your interest as you were growing up and what basically drew to drew you towards uh, the field of ecology and environment and the kind of work that you did i was uh, brought up in uh, pune and our house was uh, really on the outskirts of the city at that time and very close to the hills uh, the highest point of pune city is vetar hill which was fairly close to where we were staying and uh, in between our houses uh, there were three houses with fairly large gardens next to each other uh, and then there were some jawar fields and then the hills there was also the then it was prabhat film company now it is film and television institute of india it was in a sense very open behind our house were lots of guava orchards and lot of uh, again open land so it was kind of a very nature friendly area and natural environment now my father was an economist and uh, he had very broad interest uh, very learned man amongst his interest was uh, natural history and birds from an early age i picked up from him uh, uh, an interest in bird watching and actually uh, there was no hurry to get children educated till the age of 5 years i was never sent to any nursery school or any such preparatory schools um, i wandered around and uh, enjoyed myself when i was 5 a private uh, tutor came home and he taught me reading writing and you know so then i directly joined the school on completion of 6 years in second standard and my father took me bird watching from age of i don't know must be four or so this vetar hill that area and, and of course those were pre pesticide days so the bird life was genuinely plentiful and i enjoyed watching but not just the birds because i became interested in other things you know it was in a way rustic environment we had two milch buffaloes our own in our house man who was looking after the buffaloes i would go to the mutha river in pune and again uh, till the whole uh, river uh, uh, side there were fields and so on, quite open areas we would walk across and then along with the buffaloes i would swim in the river and uh, we will catch fish and i will bring them and keep them in aquaria and then not only fish but uh, leeches and i would bring them and keep them in glass bowls enjoyed myself as i said uh, i guess most of the time till the age of 6 i never wore any even chappals or shoes forget shoes so we were wandering barefoot all around now the, some in major events kind of got me interested in the whole range of things at reasonably young age four of them were at the age of 14 i really enjoyed watching one particular bird amongst the many which was the green beater and uh, there were wires electric wires and the uh, wires had huge number flocks of green beaters at that time and at a point in time the green beaters you know they have these square cut tails with a, a pin feather sticking out that pin feather was missing i asked my father and we had a nice collection of bird books we looked up there was no mention of a green eater without that pin feather my father had with his interest in bird watching and other things I joined the Bombay Natural History Society before I was born, and he personally was a good friend of Salim Ali. So he said, "Look, you better write to Salim Ali." And he replied quite remarkably within three days in his own quite stylish long hand. I got a letter saying that uh, at certain season the birds molt, and the pin feather is away uh, goes off with the molt. and it takes a little longer to grow back so for a few weeks you will see these bee eaters without the pin feather 
And indeed, a uh, few weeks later, the pin feather reappeared. So I really became interested. And Salim Ali used to come to Pune that time to study Maya Weaver birds. Uh, there were all these canals near Parvati Hills where Maya Weaver birds uh, uh, nested and he used to come. So on his next visit, I went to see him and he was very happy. He was very happy to have young boys get interested seriously in bird watching. And we had long talks and I was charmed. You know, he had real enthusiasm. He was a very witty person. His knowledge of birds, of course, was profound. So I was charmed and I said, what shall I do with life? And I said, well, I must become like him, a man who wanders around the hills and uh, dales and watches birds and maybe other um, uh, manifestations of diversity of life. And I told my father that this is what I'm going to do. So he was very open-minded. My father, as I said, he was an economist and he was very much involved in economic development planning and so on. So he was a member of the Maharashtra State Irrigation Commission. And the State Irrigation Commission held a meeting again in 1956. I was born in 42 at Koinadagar. Koinadagar is the big dam, you know, hydroelectric project. And uh, he took me along. He said, come, let's go. So he said, come along. So we went. He was normally quite cheerful. But that evening, he was really very distraught. And I looked sad, and I said, what is the problem? He said, look, now you have seen how much good natural forest we have destroyed for this project. That is one thing, but not just that, that how many people have lost their lands under the reservoir. And I can see from all the discussions, there is no thought of any compensation, proper rehabilitation. So both this undue destruction of natural environment and undue destruction of life of people, both of them had very much concerned him. You know? and so that was, that is the environment development called a drum, if you wish, and it kind of hit me. Then he was also very conscious of social inequities. And the fourth development was, uh, I, I do not know if you know of, uh, the greatest evolutionary biologist of last century was J.B.S. Haldane. J.B.S. Haldane was a remarkable man. Uh, he not only did very, very, very important work in the uh, field of evolutionary biology uh, and pioneered mathematical theory of evolution, uh, he also pioneered mathematical theory of enzyme kinetics. But anyway, I was reading his books and I became very interested in his brand of science. Now, Salim Ali's brand of science was basically descriptive science. Now, his was analytical, uh, what we call, uh, you know, the hypothetical deductive method of science. Uh, he was a genuine proponent of that. And one should not say this perhaps, but at Harvard, when I was a student there, we used to call descriptive science stamp collection. And you should not be a stamp collector. You should be a genuine scientist. You should uh, pose hypotheses. You should verify them and uh, do, do science at that level. Now, I read uh, with great interest Holden's work and decided I will do that kind of science. Then the fifth um, development, which maybe was important in determining the course of my life was that at the age of 22, I was doing MSc in zoology in Mumbai University. I was a good athlete. I was at one point a uh, holder of then Bombay State it was. Uh, under 14 as well as under 16 high jump records. I was a holder of Pune University high jump record and I used to travel for with the athletics teams uh, for all sorts of tournaments. 
I was doing botany, zoology, chemistry. Now, fortunately for me, I was doing MSc in marine biology in Mumbai University, zoology with specialization. And there was this Indian Ocean Expedition and a Harvard oceanographer, biological oceanographer, Giles Mead was going to be in Mumbai. Uh, so when I applied to Harvard, they wrote back saying that he will interview you, he will recommend, and we will go on his recommendation. So he phoned me and uh, he was staying in Taj in Mumbai. I was at in the Institute of Science anyway. So I, uh, he called me to see him. I walked by and he was, a, he was a wonderful man anyway. So we had a long chat about what my interests were and I had uh, specially offered, though most students wouldn't, to do a dissertation for MSc. So I was doing a dissertation on a biology of a fish species. And I talked about it. Uh, and I also talked about my interest in mathematical modeling. Uh, although, you know, I, I had to perforce take botany, zoology, chemistry, I was always interested in also actually mathematics, statistics, and uh, Haldane's brand of biology. So I had uh, organized a private tutor to come home and teach me BSc level mathematics while I finished my BSc in other subjects. So anyway, so I knew I was good at that also. So he was very happy. That was how, you know, a kind of a whole course of life went on. These are things that I don't think reading articles or searching on Google will get these personal stories. So thank you for sharing that. I am also personally born in Pune. But when you talk about Parvati Hills now, that's not how I saw it growing up. It was definitely not a bird watching spot or a spot that was uh, something you would go to actually be closer to nature or environment. It's completely different now. So I am glad I could hear that from you as well. Um, and also thank you for sharing your journey till Harvard. And of course, the next question that I had was you returned from Harvard back to India and you had such uh, a long journey after that in India, especially and something that we as MSc students, even in my college, what we talk about is the work you've done for the Western Ghats. Uh, so you'd like to know your journey from returning from Harvard and what were your inspiration and also obstacles during the course of that journey um, once you returned and the kind of things that you took up after that. So at Harvard, I began, I made some unusual choices. The day we joined, uh, there were 30 of us students. Uh, there was only one biology department that time. Now, regretfully, it is split into organismic evolutionary and cellular and molecular as separate departments. But it was just one, which was a good thing. And so 30 students were given a preliminary test on your background. And on the basis of that, they would decide whether you have to compulsorily take some courses. You have to take courses, but which courses are compulsory and which are not. And I was quite pleasantly surprised. They said, you are not weak in anything. So you have to take for first two years all these courses, but you can take any course you wish. So I decided to take seriously courses in mathematics and probability and so on, on one side. And on the other, uh, evolutionary biology, especially ecology, those kinds of courses. In evolutionary biology field, Edward O. Wilson, you might have heard of him, he's a very well-known man. E. O. Wilson was kind of the rising star. And he taught this course on evolutionary biology. And uh, I was, uh, I really enjoyed that course. And uh, I must have done very well because the day the exams were over and the grades were out, Wilson and I were riding in the elevator together in biological laboratories. He congratulated me. He said, Madhav, you have done extremely well. I am very happy. I may say that that was the time at which I Completely, I was always fairly chicken and confident, but I became fully self-confident that whatever it is, I will do and I will do well. Then we became very close. He talked a lot to me 
He talked among other things about scientific method and uh, what we talk call a hypothetical deductive method and how true science must follow this path and so on. Then he made another remark. He said, with you, I know one thing, that most other human beings, including biologists, undergo a Brownian motion through life. You know, so there are particles floating around. You know, Brownian motion, uh, that is uh, uh, where uh, fluid particles in the uh, water or gases, they float around. Another particle bumps into them. They change their direction. And then a third particle bumps into them. They change or again change their direction. There is no kind of determined progressive in any one direction. So he said, you are a person who will not undergo Brownian motion. I know that you will know what you want to do and you will do it. And as I said, he was really uh, very encouraging. Now he was interested in uh, developing what was called mathematical population biology. That field was being developed at that time. He had a student uh, from applied mathematics, a good computer scientist, William Bossert, who had done a PhD thesis uh, on a model of an evolutionary phenomenon, character displacement with Wilson. Bossert was then an assistant professor. Wilson was a full professor, of course. Now, I got to know Bossert also with Wilson. And uh, I came to the conclusion that I would like, as I said, follow Holden and do actually a mathematical thesis. Nobody had done in biology at, uh, in, uh, at Harvard. Of course, there were other mathematical theses, including Bossert's, but he was from Applied Mathematics Computer Science stream. So I will do it. And of course, I had the great advantage also because uh, if uh, I needed to get some mathematics properly clarified, then Sulachana was always ready to help. So she was doing her PhD in Applied Mathematics at Harvard. Then uh, I attended with her. There was an Applied Mathematician, George Carrier, brilliant man. Anyway, so he gave a course on mathematical models. It was a very well uh, taught course. Uh, uh, brilliant, uh, he was a brilliant teacher. So I learned, uh, you know, uh, about modeling through some of the best people available. And then I did this thesis uh, on evolution of uh, life history parameters, birth dates, death rates, growth rates, and so on. It was, uh, it was, it was, I, I had many remarkable experiences in life. So I started on it, uh, and then uh, one and a half years later, when I had barely completed three years, most students took four or five for their PhD. Uh, Bossert called me, uh, I was working with him. He taught me, uh, you know, whatever I needed of programming, and so on, I became a good programmer. He called me and he said, you have got your PhD. I said, what the hell? I had never expected. He said, no, no, this is more than enough. You can get your degree. Now, what you want to do, further you decide. But Wilson and I want you to stay on Harvard faculty. I said, no, but I, am, I have question, doubts about permanently staying on Harvard faculty. But uh, certainly for a couple of years, uh, I would give it, so I would mean, enjoy it. But uh, he said, now it's his third year, and we can give you a, either an assistant professor's appointment if you agree to stay three years, or a lecturer's appointment if you agree to stay for the two years. I said, okay, I will take your offer of lecturer's appointment. But uh, one year, he said, is free. So he said that, listen, what you should do is, I will give you one of these IBM fellowships. The IBM uh, company gave these fellowships to students who were not in computer science, but who had made good use of computers, six of them every year. So that year I got in biology, then there was an economist, there was a physicist, there was a linguist and so on. And uh, one year I had free. And this is what done. I decided to prepare for my course. So I would, I would, I decided to 
teach a new course in ecology. The course in ecology that was being taught was by George Clark. He was a traditional ecologist, a nice man, uh, but it had the ecology he taught had no mention of human beings. Human beings were not part of the ecological world. Now, for me, this was uh, absurd that human beings uh, were very much part and they uh, profoundly affected the ecological world. So one must uh, think about it. And I had the whole uh, time available to me, one year, to read and to prepare for the course. And then uh, develop some other interest. I was interested in history and philosophy of science. So completely out of interest, uh, I took a course in history and philosophy of science by Hilary Putnam, who's an interesting man. So I took that course and I, I read up and I developed a very broad understanding of ecology because that year was a very good opportunity to develop such an understanding. I uh, gave that course, two years I gave courses, uh, uh, undergraduate course on ecology with this broader perspective and a graduate course on mathematical models in ecology. Both were well received. So that was how I came back to India. Uh, so people were actually amazed that uh, here I'm throwing out, throwing up an assistant professorship at Harvard and without any job returning. Uh, but anyway, the Council of Scientific Industrial Research had these positions for such scientists, so they would pay for two years. And I had uh, this Agarka Research Institute in Pune. Uh, I, they hosted me. And I became interested in newer things, and I did this study of sacred graphs, which was, uh, which was a tremendous learning experience because I spent a lot of time in the field uh, camping in these villages. Uh, they were in the catchment of the Panshek Dam, uh, which had collapsed in 1961, but had been rebuilt uh, now. And uh, in the catchment were these villages, uh, which had... Uh, many good sacred graphs. Professor Satish Dhawan, who was then director, he was looking for a person in atmospheric or oceanic science. And she was asked by one of uh, some contact to apply because he wanted such a faculty member. So she wrote to him, applied, and then also said that, uh, look, but uh, my husband also has a PhD from Harvard uh, and this experience. Uh, would you be able to consider him? So luckily, as it happened, Satish Dhawan also wanted to uh, start a, a center where there would be mathematical biologists, maybe linguists, and so on. So he said, of course. So he let him apply. So both of us are applied together. And both of us uh, were uh, recruited. Sat Satish Dhawan was a wonderful man. He treated us with great courtesy. Uh, we were asked to give naturally job seminars. There were no interviews, but job seminars. And after both of our seminars, he uh, invited us for dinner to his house and offered us the jobs. And uh, Satish Dhawan, uh, I don't know you know about him much, but he was a remarkable man, a genuinely honest, upright person. And he was a tremendous support for me in many ways. He, although he recruited me to work in mathematical biology, he appreciated ecology and those kinds of concerns and research. He, he was also a personal friend of Salim Ali. So when I said that I want to not only do mathematical biology, I continue, I enjoy it, but want to do ecological field work, uh, and uh, then we set up a program in Bandipur Research uh, uh, Tiger Reserve. He encouraged me. That was the kind of remarkable man. Fortunately, I worked under. And then, of course, uh, Indian Institute of Science retains much of this tradition. It has gone on very, very well. Thank you, sir. One thing that I did want to ask you, of course, was your experience with the whole uh, the development of the Cardgill report for the Western Guard space. Uh, we wanted to know what your journey in that was like and uh, 
again what was what were your key learnings and how did you um, take the reactions and the responses that came to what was done how was that experience for you okay i mean so the western ghat ecology expert panel had a long background uh, as i said from i was born in, the, in pune very close to the hills of western ghat said uh, from a young age uh, not only the veta hill but we used to go to sihagad and uh, other parts of the western ghats uh, uh, for vacations uh, and uh, my father was very interested uh, western ghats in the sense had charmed me from a very young uh, age of course from both agarkar research institute all those studies of sacred groves were on western ghat hills and then from indian institute of science uh, from our bandipur research program uh, which is on mysore plateau and, but at the jung jung tri junction of you know karnataka tamil nadu and uh, kerala and you have the nilgiris and we also had a sub station a field station in nilgiris and uh, i worked in nilgiris also there was uh, a proposal from unesco they have a program called man and biosphere program about biosphere reserves in india so i had been doing studies in that region including in nilgiris and uh, bp pal was the chairman of the national committee on environmental planning and coordination in 1980 or so he is a well known agricultural scientist he retired as director general of indian council of agricultural research and he was a uh, genuinely interested intrigued by ecological questions and interested in them and uh, i proposed to him that i will prepare a proposal for nilgiri biosphere reserve and uh, he was very happy so in 1980 uh, he commissioned me to undertake a study do a proper study of the uh, nilgiri area uh, but that nilgiri biosphere reserve was to include both uh, bandipur nagarhole wayanad in kerala and the nilgiris so I, so that was another uh, major study and prepared me proposal and so on and uh, after that uh, studies in this uh, variety of studies uh, continued i was interested in getting people as a network to undertake ecological monitoring so the planning commission uh, gave me a project to look at the implementation of western ghat development program of the planning commission in karnataka and in their usual fashion they wanted to give a grant on which i will employ some research assistants and so on and do the work but i i had the idea and i proposed that instead of just my research assistant it would be much more worthwhile to develop a network of colleges in western ghats of karnataka to undertake such a exercise of monitoring and uh, of course i could use uh, the money there within the same limit for that and instead of paying any research assistants for myself uh, pay the colleges small amounts they will undertake through their students and so on this monitoring so this was uh, in 1989 and experimented decentralized monitoring and uh, this covered uh, all of western ghats it was very successful uh, many of the college uh, uh, teachers and students were very enthusiastic uh, even today they are in touch with me from 1989 in between actually i had done an exercise uh, field work to ask people for what their reactions were about environmental issues and what they wanted in 1980 mrs gandhi wanted to set up this uh, environment uh, department in her government and uh, dr ms swaminathan was uh, involved a committee was set up to prepare the uh, guidelines for how the department should work so i proposed to the uh, committee that uh, okay we can sit in delhi and prepare guidelines but it would be much more interesting to uh, actually ask people at least a sample of people in different ecological regions 
And I was given a small grant. So I went and spent uh, a week in Goa and with their mining problems and overfishing and water pollution, which was a depleting fishery. I went to Jaisalmer and Jodhpur and uh, the desert areas problems and the Bishnoi communities and, uh, and their concerns and uh, commitment to nature conservation and Himalayas uh, with uh, Sundarlal Bhaugada and uh, looking at the Himalayan peasants and their concerns. Then uh, in Madhya Pradesh uh, near Hoshangabad, there was this Tawa Dam, which led to serious water logging and other problems and to talk to farmers of Madhya Pradesh. And finally, to also irrigated the tracks of Maharashtra in Ahmednagar districts especially. So this uh, kind of exercise I had taken, undertaken. Then there was a, another program called Biodiversity Conservation Prioritization Program of uh, World Wildlife Fund. And again, they were thinking only of priorities in terms of species and localities. I said, but you must also think of priorities in terms of what will gain people's support for that. And we must understand motivation for, uh, you know, which people will have to support. And this was 1995. So in 1992, we had the Rio Convention. And the Rio Convention had many provisions which were very pertinent getting indigenous communities involved, local communities involved. So it could fit in in a sense uh, with what uh, the conventions uh, provisions were saying. So this was a very interesting project. We had 50 different agencies uh, from Himachal Pradesh, Rajasthan, uh, Bihar, uh, Jharkhand, uh, Andabad and Nicobars, uh, Maharashtra, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, Kerala, uh, West Bengal. So we did uh, also Assam, Assam. And so it was a very interesting uh, project which involved working with local communities in developing the documentation, which we called uh, People's Biodiversity Register, uh, which was a kind of provision which was appropriate uh, for uh, implementation of uh, Convention on Biological Diversity. So this uh, led us to, uh, permitted us to test and develop the methodology for preparation of people's biodiversity registers by uh, the biodiversity management committees, which would be set up. So eventually as part of the Biological Diversity Act's provision, and I must mention that just like Satish Dhawan, MS Swaminathan has been always extremely supportive. He was chairman of the uh, committee that was uh, to formulate the Biological Diversity Act. I was one of the members. Uh, and so we got the provision through. They would always say, oh, these uh, ignorant people cannot identify species. But today, you know, there is this Google photo and lens applications that using those apps, I have uh, students working in. Garchiroli, uh, who have been working with me, some of them are very clever, but they are failed 10 standard because they get such wretched education and they don't know English. But they can now take the photographs and they know the scientific names and they have, now there is this community forest rights provision and they have the ownership of the minor forest produce and they not only know the Gundi names, but because of this app, they know the scientific names. So they can go to Wikipedia and find out about their uses, and they can uh, find out uh, markets in Hyderabad because once they know the scientific name, they can figure out the Telugu name and so on. So it is, beginning, it is beginning to make some remarkable differences. Uh, I know that you have worked closely with NCRT as well in terms of the environment education curriculum in schools. So what I want to know from you is how important do you think environment education is and how do you think it can be made effective, especially in schools today, uh, to basically inspire young children? In 2005, there is a, every few years, I believe, there is a national curriculum framework review. And that national curriculum framework review, which is handled by 
NCERT, uh, National Council of Educational Research and Training in Delhi, I think that is. Uh, they appointed a committee and I was subcommittee on environment, I chair. And we prepared a report and we gave uh, detailed suggestions on how environmental education projects could be used, uh, programs could be used to begin to develop a good picture of India's environment, that they should not be merely projects uh, which will then students uh, will undertake and that will be there. Because I had seen uh, there is a, a program, uh, I'm forgetting what, it is a kind of a Department of Science and Technology program where they have competitions at district level, state level, and uh, country level, at least they used to have in those periods, where the students do projects and then they make presentations. So one year the theme was water. And in Bhodeshwar, there were the national level presentations. And this was before 2005, maybe 2002, three, whatever. And I had attended that. I was interested uh, I, from Karnataka. I was working with a lot of school, schools and uh, students in schools who had also participated in such projects. Uh, and uh, there was a Karnataka Rajya Vidyan Parishad of which I was at that time chairman. Anyway, so I went uh, and uh, attended and here were these projects which were very good, which provided some very good data on all sorts of issues, groundwater depletion, pollution, and so on. In 2005, when we did this uh, report, it was clear that now the technology, the internet and all is available, that all this can be used to develop a national level, good environmental database. This is what we should do. And I strongly recommended and spelled out the details in that report and so on. Uh, in fact, they are, I mean, our education, I am amazed. I am seeing that all these project students are doing, not just environmental education, but all sorts of other uh, subjects. It is their parents who are doing those projects. And they are insisting that you buy some things. For example, you have my granddaughters. Uh, I was aghast, was asked to do a project on structure of a plant seedling. So there are the roots and the step and the leaves and whatever. And uh, no, no, you cannot actually draw on a piece of paper drawing of a seedling. You must buy in the market. There are available these pictures and then you must stick them. So their parents will buy the pictures and stick them. And then what do the students learn from the projects? This is unfortunately the state of our education, I am afraid. I had one final question so for you. It is one thing to, of course, achieve success, but it's another thing to manage success through your journey. So how would you say you have managed success throughout? And what values do you think young people need to instill within themselves to say manage success as they go forward? See, what people are mostly looking for when they talk about success is money prestige and power. I never aimed at getting any of this. Now it so happens, for instance, because I worked so honestly for a long time, I was given an appointment in the United Nations uh, Global Environment Facility as chairman of their science and technology advisory panel, which uh, paid me very handsomely. So I ended up with lots of money. But I had never aimed at getting worked um, at getting such an appointment. It's not possible to actually work at it. It so happened. And there are, I think, uh, I have, uh, as far as I am concerned, I can see a lot of uh, uh, social prestige uh, coming to me. Not again that I have not uh, tried hard for it, but in various ways. Power, I am not interested in. And I never tried to get uh, at any of the power. So whatever I wanted, success, uh, you may say, it has come out of working uh, focused, honest, uh, 
effort at whatever I was uh, interested in, all the both social concerns, environmental concerns, scientific interests, of course, uh, uh, and uh, it has happened. So uh, there was no question of managing success. Thank you so much, sir. That was the final question I had for you. Uh, once again, thank you for taking your time out to join us for this interview. It is, as someone who is just starting my journey in the conservation space, it's very inspiring to get this first-hand opportunity to hear from your personal stories and experiences. Uh, so yes, thank you once again for taking the time out. It's been a complete honor. Thank you. Thank you.